This morning we're going to be looking at a few verses in Isaiah. So if you would please turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 52. We're going to begin reading the last verses of 52 and read through uh, chapter 53. So Isaiah 52 beginning in verse 13. Again, we see the image in here of sheep, but in this case, Christ is the one who is the sheep. He is the lamb who lays down his life that others may have life. But again, uh, I want to draw your attention to the fact that in verse 10, in particular, we're going to see that Jesus actually receives a reward for this work that he does. Isaiah 52, beginning in verse 13. Behold, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. Just as many were astonished at you, my people, so his appearance was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. Thus he will sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths on account of him for what had not been told them they will see and what they had not heard they will understand. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him and by his scourging we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. I hope you can see from this passage two things. That the sufferings that the righteous servant of the Lord, who is the Lord Jesus Christ, went through were not for him, but he bore the transgressions of his people and he died in their place. The second thing is that for this work, his father rewards him. And that's really what the work of the kingdom and the work of evangelism is all about and why revivals exist. So that's what we want to look at this morning. Now, I've already told you this month we are spending some time looking at uh, the subject of revival. Uh, in particular, that revival that took place in the 18th century, the 1700s, called the Great Awakening. And in the past, we, as I've said, combined what we're doing in the morning with what we're doing in the evening. 
so that we can get a better understanding, a fuller understanding of this particular subject. Now what I'd like us to do then this morning is to step back and take a look at what we call the big picture and to ask the question how revivals fit into the overall plan of God. And the answer to this is basically um, this. That, answer, that revivals certainly are special works of God. They are meant to move the kingdom forward even more powerfully than God might do under ordinary circumstances. In other words, God is always moving the kingdom forward at some, in some measure. Uh, his spirit is always given so that we might have some power to do his work. But during times of revival, God gives even more power, more strength, that he might gather in more of his people. Now, in order to see this more clearly, we're going to break this subject down in the mornings into these five topics. The first one, which we're going to be looking at this morning, is this, that revivals are a means of bringing in more of Christ's sheep. Second week, we're going to be looking at revivals as a means of taking back more ground from Satan. And that has to do with more ground, you might say, of this uh, world versus just purely gathering in the elect. The third has to do with the fact that in, that in revival, the way that God works is by pouring out his spirit in greater measure into the hearts of really all men, but in different ways. The fourth week, that revivals are sent sovereignly by God at a time when he chooses. And we're going to see that that is a pretty stark contrast to those who are involved in revivalism, who believe that you can basically have a revival anytime you want. Just got to do the right things. But fifthly, and the fifth week, we want to understand that even though God sends these things sovereignly, it doesn't mean that we don't have any part in it. It doesn't mean there aren't means by which uh, he brings revival. So we're going to look at those means the fifth week, that God typically sends revival when his people repent and when they pray and when they set their hearts to evangelize. Now this morning we're going to consider that revivals are a means of bringing in more of Christ's sheep. Our passage, first of all, reminds us that Jesus came into this world with a particular work that he had to do. He was sent for a specific purpose, and that was to lay down his life as a guilt offering for the sins of his people. He came to save them, to redeem them. But it also reminds us that the Father has promised to him a reward for this work that is the very people for whom the Lord lays down his life. This morning, let's consider three things. First of all, let's consider this work that Jesus did. Secondly, let's consider his reward for that work. And then thirdly, let's consider that revivals are one means of bringing that reward in. So first of all, let's see that Jesus came into this world with a particular work to do. And before we consider what that work was, let's step back one step further and consider again the larger picture. This work that Jesus came to do is basically what everything that you see around you, everything that God has ever made, everything is really all about. It's why God made the worlds. It's why he made the universe. It's the reason why God created you and everybody else and everything else in this world. This theme is what has shaped all of history. Now the universe we might see in this world in particular, this planet anyway, uh, was created by God as a stage, as we know, in which God would reveal himself, in which he would reveal his glory. He would reveal his attributes. But the main thing that God intended to reveal through this creation was his grace basically his infinite love to undeserving sinners. This is really what the Lord has done through the work of redemption. When he brought about the reconciliation of fallen man with himself through his son, he revealed his grace, the glory of his grace. So that's why the world exists as, as a stage in which all these things would take place where God could reveal all of his attributes, but particularly 
that attribute of his infinite love and grace. Now that is also why we exist. Why the Lord made us in the first place. Why he made Adam and Eve and put them on probation in the Garden of Eden. Why he allowed us to fall into sin. Why Satan was allowed in the garden to tempt the man and the woman. By the way, when they fell, they certainly fell by their own choice. We do know it was a part of God's plan. But that was a choice they made. This was that he might send his son into the world as one of us, as a man, so that he might live for us, that he might die for us, that he might save us. So this is the reason why we exist, why man is here. This is the reason why he sent Jesus Christ into the world. And this is the reason why God has planned everything that he has planned. Remember, God is sovereign, and he has a comprehensive, absolute decree in which he has planned Everything that's ever going to take place, it's all a part of that plan. But do you realize that everything that God has planned, everything that has happened in the world and everything that ever will happen in the world, not only the good things but also the bad, it was all for this work of redemption. This is the one unifying theme that binds everything together. It is the purpose for everything that exists. It is the main way that God would bring glory to himself and to his son through this work of redeeming mankind. And so this is the work that Jesus came into the world to accomplish. This was the fullness of time. This was uh, the, the accomplishment of God's plan. This was the center, as it were, of the universe, the center of time. That's why, by the way, we used to, um, it's been changed now, but we used to call a uh, time before the birth of Christ, uh, B.C., and the time after Christ, you know, before Christ, and then the year of our Lord, uh, you know, A.D. I understand that that's been changed, but the fact that that redemptive act was seen largely by the world to be the center of time. See, that that's, again shows us the reason why Jesus comes into the world. It's why he became a man. It's why he obeyed his Father. By preaching the gospel by suffering persecution, by dying on the cross, and by being raised again to life. Why it was he ascended into heaven, and why he now reigns in heaven, and why he is coming again. Our Lord Jesus Christ has done all these things that he might glorify his Father, so that the Father might glorify him in the work of redemption. This is the ultimate answer to the question, why? If you ask why long enough, you ultimately resolve it here. Everything revolves around this. Now, I think we should pause here for a moment to consider that if this really is the reason behind everything that is, and if it is the reason behind your existence and my existence, then I think it's clear that this is also what we ought to be living for. This is to be... Uh, our goal in life. This is what is to basically inform everything that we do. The advancement of God's kingdom. And that's also, of course, what our Lord Jesus Christ means when he says this in John 8.31. If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. What does it mean to continue in the word of Jesus? Except to do that, which we saw a little bit earlier, to hear the voice of the shepherd and to follow him. And that, by the way, is not just on the Lord's Day, but that's every day of the week. And it's not just in some acts, but it's in absolutely everything we do. Listen to what Paul says in Colossians 3.17. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Or in that same chapter, verses 23 and 24. Whatever you do, and by the way, that is all-encompassing, whatever, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. And then finally, again, to remind us that this is to be all-encompassing. 
Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Now again, what he means is not that we drop everything we're doing, quit our jobs, uh, go out on the street full-time evangelizing or become missionaries to different countries because we're not all called to do that. But what it does mean is that when we do what it is we're called to do, that we do those things for the glory of God, that we always have his interests in mind. Even as we began the time of, of prayer during the service, I was asking that the Lord would help us to be able to pray with his glory in view. Oftentimes when we ask for particular things, we ask for those things because we want them. We want God to heal us. We want God to bless us. We want him uh, to provide for us. But we, we're thinking mainly about ourselves. Now, we can pray those things, but we, can, we need to pray them with God's glory in view. Lord, heal me so that I may do what you've called me to do. Provide for me so that you can be shown to be faithful to your promises. Uh, heal this person so that they may give glory to you or that it may be a means of bringing them to faith and repentance. You see, we can have a different motive or goal behind the things that we ask besides just the things that we think we need or that others need. It needs to go beyond our own personal concerns and it needs to go to God's glory. Now again, this can, this can mean everything that we're doing except of course our sins. We can never do uh, our sins to God's glory. Those are the things we need to cut off and put to death. Those things need to be laid aside, but the things that we do, whatever we do, all that we do, needs to be done with this particular goal in mind, advancing the kingdom of heaven. Now, you need to realize that if this isn't what you're working for, if this isn't what you're living for, if this isn't the reason you think and you speak, then you're really not serving the Lord in the things that you do. Everything that we do needs to be calculated to further this particular goal, and that is the work of redemption. Now again, mainly, that what that work is mainly comprised of is basically evangelism. It's basically being a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, Jesus came and he laid the foundation along with his apostles. And the only thing that's left for us to do is to advance that work by getting the gospel out and by making sure that every single thing that we do in life either directly advances the kingdom of heaven through our service to the Lord or indirectly advances the kingdom of heaven uh, through the things that we do by way of our personal testimony and witness. We need to realize that um, the way we live and the, uh, you might say the heart with which we do it speaks volumes more than any words that we can possibly utter. If people see that we are intense for that one thing, if they see that we really believe it and are earnest about it, it will do more to transform the lives of others than, again, any words that we could possibly say to them. The way that we say it, not acting, but with intensity and with conviction and with, with pathos, with, with heart and with humility, the things that we do, the way that we live, again, it, it's going to show that we're either living for Christ or we're not. If we're not, if we're, well, I should say this, if we're going to be disciples in word only, we're not really going to accomplish much. We have to be disciples both in word and in life. Because if we, if we say we're Christ's disciples, but we're really not living as though we are, I mean, the Bible has a word for that. It's called hypocrisy. And the Lord wants us to repent of hypocrisy and do what we know he calls us to do. So next time you think about doing whatever it is you do, ask yourself this basic question, how will this advance the kingdom of heaven? How will this fulfill why God made me in the first place? How will this do what God wants accomplished if it doesn't? then you need to realize that not only are you disobeying God by serving yourself, you're also pouring your precious time down a hole and you're losing it forever. You know, when Paul says we need to redeem the time or uh, as Jonathan Edwards preaches a sermon on the redemption of time, he, 
points out how precious time is. I mean, time is what your life is made of. It's what my life is made of. And every time we just throw our, our time away to frivolous things that really have nothing to do with the kingdom of heaven but have everything to do with just us, we're just pouring it away. We're, we're throwing it away. We're, we're not buying it up for God's glory. Place yourself on the day of judgment, standing before the Lord as the Lord looks at your works. Remember the things that you do for yourself. That's the, the wood, hay, and straw, the stuff that's going to burn up. But the things you do for him, for his glory, those are the things that are going to remain and the things you're going to be rewarded for. But those things can, again, be, can be everything that you do in the course of a day, as long as, again, it's not sinful in and of itself, if you are doing it for God's glory. So again, this is what the world was created for, what you were made for. This is why Jesus came into the world. Everything revolves around the work of redemption. This is what you and I are to be advancing through our lives. In everything we do, we are to be giving our lives to this, which is why it's very important that we don't get caught up in what the people of the world are doing. It's like a, a humongous snare that's waiting just to swallow us up or to, to, to capture us and to keep us in, in chains until we're released by the Lord. That's what revival is all about, by the way, too. And we see that we are entrapped by the world and we want to be freed and so we repent and we begin doing what God has called us to do again. It's that extra, uh, uh, as it were, energizing of the Holy Spirit, that extra boost of spirituality that God gives now, this brings us to the second point, and that is that Jesus does receive a reward for this work, and that reward is those for whom he has laid down his life. Again, Isaiah writes in Isaiah 53, 10, but the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As we also saw in Hebrews uh, chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, our meditation. Speaking from his own perspective, Jesus says this, I will proclaim your name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children whom God has given me. Now remember that Jesus did not do this work for nothing. He did it for particular reasons, a specific purpose. The first reason was because he loved his father and he wanted to repair the damage that was done to the father's honor and glory. You need to realize that God could never have shown mercy to even to one person without dishonor to his own name unless the son had come and given himself as an offering for sin, to pay for our crimes. So Jesus came into the world in order to repair the, uh, the dishonor done to his Father's name. And that in and of itself is a reward for Jesus to do that, a reason. But there was another reason why he came into the world. He also came into the world to do this work of redemption for us, for you and for me, if you're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you are... You are his brethren. You are his brothers and his sisters. You are his children. You are his reward. When you think about what it is that our Lord Jesus Christ is going to be able to take out of this world, everything that exists, remember everything is going to vanish in, in one cataclysmic explosion. Uh, on the day of judgment, I believe, after the Lord has raised all the dead and changed all the living and brought them together for judgment. By the time that judgment is over, the new heavens and the new earth are there. But all that he is going to be able to take out of this world, out of this creation, out of everything that has existed in this world is basically just this, his people, you and me. We are the reward and the whole church of the Lord is his reward. So again, this is what Jesus receives. By the way, I just wanted to mention this as well because um, in this world of, of sort of the self-esteem cult and so forth, 
we need to understand that this is the reason why we have any value at all is because of the value that Jesus places on us. Sometimes even as Christians, we can struggle with self-worth or self-esteem. But here is the cure. You're never going really to find that worth in and of yourself. And by the way, I know that, that our young people do that as well. I was young once and I know what that's like. You, you try to find value in yourself because that's where your self-identity comes from. And if you don't find it, that's the reason why a lot of um, young people end up committing suicides because they don't measure up. They don't feel like they're worth it. They feel like they're worth less. So they might as well get rid of themselves. Well, you're never going to find it in and of yourselves. You're not going to find it by measuring yourself by the idols of the world. If I don't measure up to them, if I can't be one of them, I don't want to live. If I can't be rich, I don't want to live. If I can't be powerful, I don't want to live. That's how people think in this world. They have to have something for themselves. But this is not where you are to find your worth. Because there is no worth in you or me. We're basically, uh, we're, well actually we were destroyed by sin and became worthless. The only value that is in us is the value that the Lord places in us or on us uh, by his grace, by his infinite mercy. That's the value that we ought to see. And it's not because you, know, you were so good looking or you were so rich or you were so talented because you only have what God gave you in the first place anyway. And if God were to look at you to see what your value was, all he would see would be sin, corruption, guilt. There really was nothing in us to move God's heart toward us because all that was there was evil. But rather, it was the value he placed on us and realizing that he did love us, he sent his son to cleanse us and to make us perfect and actually, in Jesus Christ, makes us like his son. That is what makes you valuable, is that the God of the universe was willing to become a man and to suffer and to die that he might have you. Well, if you can't find value in that, you're not going to find it in anything. So it's not that you or I were worth it in and of ourselves. His love for you is what made it worth it to him. When you love somebody, it increases that person's value to you. And the value that you should see in yourself is the fact that the Lord places value on you. Uh, again, purely by his grace. But again, let's not forget that part of the reason for your existence too and for the Lord saving you is not only that you, know, you would have self-value and worth and that you would be a part of Christ's reward, but it's also that you might be part of the means for gathering those sheep in that the Lord has saved. That work has been entrusted to you and to me. Jesus said to his disciples, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Now the men he spoke those words to have finished their part of the job and they have entered into their rest. They're now in glory. So the question is who is going to carry on this work in this particular generation? Well, the Lord calls you. As he said to Isaiah in his day, so he says to you and to me today, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Now your response should be what Isaiah's was. Here am I, send me. Now again, we realize that you and I don't have exactly the same responsibility or calling that Isaiah had but your life, as well as his life, needs to be devoted to this work. That is the reason why the Lord made you. So again, God made all that he did for this one work, the work of redemption. Jesus Christ came into the world to accomplish that work. Again, that is the center, that is the goal, that is the purpose of absolutely everything. And Jesus receives a reward for that work. That reward is you and me and all the other sheep that are yet to be gathered in, and it is our responsibility to bring them in. Thankfully, not just the small group of people here this morning, but the responsibility of the whole church to do this. But let's not just leave the whole responsibility on the other parts of the body. We need to do our part as well. Now, finally, getting to the point of revival. 
you do need to see that revivals are one of the means for bringing in this reward. Now, revival is not something different that God does. It's really a matter of degree. God is doing this all the time, but when he does this, it's more, more of what he does. The Lord always sends his spirit to empower his people. He is always sending his spirit to awaken sinners to their condition and even to convert the lost. But sometimes he gives more of his spirit than he does at other times. And when he does, his people are strengthened to do that work. More people are awakened to their danger because of the work that his people are doing and also because of the work of the spirit in society. And more people are converted. More people are actually saved. And so more of Christ's reward is brought in to him. This is the why of revival, why it exists. Revival exists for the same reason that everything else exists, which is to advance the glory of God through the salvation of sinners, to gather Christ's sheep in, that that work might move forward, that Jesus might have his reward for this great work that he has done and that he and his father might be glorified. Now, this is one very good reason why you should be interested in revival, because it helps you to do the work that the Lord has called you to do. I mean, people, this is a crass way of putting it, but you know, you've seen those commercials for five-hour energy and you know the, uh, those energy drinks. People drink those energy drinks, so they'll have more energy to do the work that they have to do, right? Well, revival is kind of like a spiritual energy drink. Again, it's kind of a crass way of putting it. But it gives you a boost, a spiritual boost, to be able to do more and to do it more easily than you could during times when it's non-revival times. It's like turning up the, the power, you know, turning up the heat, in this case, the heat of affection in your heart so that you are driven to do these things, whereas you might be struggling during times of non-revival. You know how Jesus said when he saw the, the temple filled with the money changers and all this stuff going on, how he made his whip and he drove them all out and overturned the tables and so forth, and it fulfilled the scripture, zeal for your house will consume me. Jesus is the one anointed with the spirit above measure. And what we see in him is the perfect paradigm of what we are to strive to be, but all this that came about in Jesus' life came about from his heart. That was the source and that heart filled with the Spirit of God. And the more we are filled with the Spirit of God, the more we'll have that heart. And that's really what it means to be revived, is to have more of the Spirit so that we might do more of this work. So you should be interested in revival because it's not just you know, local or global. It's not just something that happens in a mass of people, but it's something that can also happen personally and something we ought to be striving for personally. So I would encourage you in light of this, not only to come this evening, where we're gonna be taking this subject up more fully and to understand more about God's work, to bless his church, and through that to bless his son, but also that it might begin to renew you in your prayers that God might personally revive you, that you might pray so that he might send revival to the entirety of his church and also to our land. I think if you watch the news very much, you'll understand we are in desperate need of revival. So that's what we want to focus on. That's what we want to begin to think about and to desire and to pray for from the heart that God would send revival. Well, let's, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's, uh, let's ask the Lord to take again these points, the reason for our existence, the, you know, what Jesus came to do and the fact that he gets this reward and that we are to gather it in, that revivals will help us do that. Let's take all those things and let's pray that God will apply them to us so that when we leave this place today, we don't just leave wondering what it is that you know, he, we heard from the pulpit, but we'll remember what we heard and be changed by these things and allow the Lord to work this desire in us. Let's spend a few moments in prayer.